So first, I'm quite impressed so many of you are here. Um, doing a keynote after the party is always quite nerve-wracking because, as I've known from previous years, you're either still drunk, wasted, or you just couldn't be asked to get out of bed. Um, and that's great that you're here, so thank you very much. Now, when I was asked to keynote BrewCon, it was actually really, really cool because this is a conference I've wanted to do in a very long time. I just never had a chance. Um, I'm in the quite luxurious position of being able to fly around the world attending conferences, and I'm on a few review boards. But this is the one con that I could just never get into the schedule. So when I was asked, it was like, yeah, this is amazing. And then reality sets in, and then sweaty palms. And what's interesting about a keynote, unlike normal research projects, is that, as Haroon alluded to yesterday, keynotes are very washy-wishy. Um, they're very opinionated. They're very hand-wavy. And it's, it's very hard, because unlike, say, a normal research project, let's say I've got an itch, the talk goes into the problem. My itch is in a place I can't reach. It's very annoying. You then go into the meat. This is how I managed to scratch that itch using a special pen. And then finally, you give away the pen and everybody claps. So you have a structure to that. To keynotes, you don't. So you generally have massive panic attack sessions all the time and change your slides like I was doing last night. So I thought, I'm going to reach out to people who are phenomenal at public speaking, people that inspired millions. And Steve Jobs is one of them. Um, if you've ever managed to watch one of his keynotes, you'll see how he managed to excite a room full of men to a degree where most people would pay money to watch that on Uborn. Um, but he was very good at doing it. So I thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch a lot of Steve Jobs videos. Um, and I also thought, let me look up the definition of what a keynote is. And a keynote is effectively a motivational speech at 10 a.m. on a Friday morning after drinking. It is a no mean feat. But it sets the tone for a conference. And I think I took this to heart. So what I did was I did a lot of background digging on the BrewCon founders, speakers. I watched every single BrewCon talk that was available in the archive, which is no mean feat because there's a lot of them. And it gave me good insight as to how this conference actually plays quite an important role in the global world of security research. Now, it's no different. We've got lots and lots of conferences on today. Pretty much every week there's a conference. Some are really bad, RSA. Um, some are really, really good. And for me, it, it paths a journey of where people are going with their research. But for the first thing, since BrewCon started, there have been 3.646 million beats. You're all looking at me like I'm mad. So I'm old enough to remember when we didn't really have a World Wide Web. Um, and in 1998, that crazy Swiss watch company came up with a phenomenal idea. So how many of you here have done co conference calls across the world with different time zones? It's a pain in the ass, especially if you're blonde. So Swatch, before the World Wide Web was around, came up with this concept of a beat. A beat was effectively a mo measurement of time. And what they thought was, let's divide a day into a thousand beats. So each beat is equivalent to 1 minute 26.4 seconds. Now you're probably thinking this is crazy. But actually there's a lot of an intellect that went into this. So rather than saying I've got a conference call with two people, Federico in New York, Johan in Belgium, and we're going to meet at my time, 11 a.m. London time. That means inevitably you go to Google and you start Googling, what time is this in my time? We've all done it. We've, it's, we still do it. What the beat managed to do was get rid of that. You can say, meet me at 300, because the day starts at 000. Like, this is a fascinating idea. You've got to have a cool watch as well, better than the Apple watch that is out at the moment. And it probably lasts a lot longer than an Apple watch, which is only meant to last a year. Um, and the cool thing is, was, this was actually incorporated as Beale Mean Time, BMT. And on the 23rd of October, this year will be the 20th anniversary. So I think it's high time we start using the beta game because it's a fascinating technology. But that brings me to the next thing. We are in a phenomenal place in history. Literally, it is revenge of the nerds. So um, I grew up in the 70s. Um, and in 1994, this movie came out. And prior to that, if you were a nerd, you were downtrodden, you were picked upon, you were abused, you were called names. Because nerds were inferior. They were weak. You know, they weren't the jock, rugby-toting type people. And I 
grew up in South Africa, and you know, if you were a rugby, oh, I don't play rugby, um, you were strong and powerful. But if you like maths and science and engineering and electronics, you were this weak little person. Flip the tables now. Those rugby players have got brain damage, and they're probably pissing in their pants and drooling, and we're effectively ruling the world. So what a time to be alive. But it goes into the stem of why we do this. So I'm sure many of you have seen a sign like this, do not push. For me, and I'm sure many of you here, you look at that sign and you go, why can't I push it? What is it made of? What's behind the button? Has anybody else pushed it? What happens if I push it with two fingers? What happens if I kick it? Can I take it off the wall? Will the world explode? For me, that's normal. For other people, they think, well, you're being told not to do it. And for me, that's the security industry. We don't generally look at stuff and go, that's OK. I know this can make phone calls. We look at it and go, actually, can I also turn it into a covert implant that we can put into a suspected terrorist house and listen to all their phone calls? For me, that's normal. We're all effectively really, really curious. But sometimes that curiosity gets us into a bit of trouble. Um, this is a ring doorbell. Has anybody got a ring doorbell? Phenomenal piece of equipment. Um, I got one because I do travel a hell of a lot. I live my life in airport lounges. And when the doorbell rings at home, I want to make sure that that's not some random person. My wife's being naughty, and I can get to see who's coming into my house. Call me, you know, GCHQ-like person. The wife was away, and I didn't have kids and I had idle fingers. Now, I'm sure many of you can attest to this. Idle fingers for hackers are bad things. So I was bored, so I thought, I wonder what's in a ring doorbell. I do a lot of hardware explo exploitation, exploration. So I pulled it off the door, and I put it on the kitchen table, and I started to look at bits of the ring doorbell. And it was fascinating. Like, wow, they built it this way. It's 200 pounds. You press the button, it records the image and video, and obviously pushes it through to the cloud. I wonder when they're storing the key. And the first thing I noticed was uh, all the chips were covered in black paint. Now, to a curious person, I'm wondering, why would you cover the chips in black paint? So I did what any normal person would do. My wife is a makeup artist. Um, I ran upstairs, went into her makeup kit, and found that the MAC makeup brushes are very good at removing black paint with her nail polish acetone. Here's a hint. But normal things, if you do bugger the brush up, please replace it before she gets home, because trust me. So there I am, looking at all the chips, pulling off the chips, writing them down, thinking, that's phenomenal, that's an eight-pin soik, I can do all that, and I get a signal message. I'll be home in half an hour. Shit. I'm left with lots of parts, acetone, dirty brushes, and non-working doorbell that she really likes. So I put it all back together. Now, just like we've all done with IKEA furniture, there are meant to be spare screws. Don't worry about it, it's a design feature. Put on the door, press the doorbell, it works. I'm thinking, I'm out of this, we're good. I thought nothing about it, I thought I've got away from this. Minus the few scratch marks around the case where I couldn't get it open. Turns out I'd introduced a bug. Not a serious bug, but I'd introduced a bug. Every day, at 1600 hours, the doorbell would go. That's not normally a problem, but I have two two-year-old boys, Los Diablos, and two dogs. And when the doorbell rings, they scream, the dogs bark, and they run around going, Daddy, 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 Daddy. That's cute for the first day. On day eight, I had a very angry little woman going, I don't care what you've done, that doorbell's getting replaced. Q 300 pounds later, and lesson learnt, don't be that curious. But last year, um, Chris Weiss Opel, who is a good friend of mine, did an amazing talk. And his talk was about how hackers change the security industry. Now, I'm going to make you all stand up, because I want to get an idea of how long everybody has been in the industry. So I really do apologize, but if everybody can stand. Can you sit down, including the bearded wonder over there? Can you sit down if you've been in this industry for more than 20 years? Cool. Can you sit down if you've been in the industry for more than 10 years? Can you sit down if you've been in the industry for more than five years? Who's been in the industry for less than three years? Stay standing. So a big chunk of you. What's phenomenal? You can sit down now, thank you. 
What's phenomenal about this is we have got such an amazing influx of new people into our industry that a lot of the times the history of what we've done has been forgotten. Now, I started hacking in the early 90s, and it's quite sad when you walk around Black Hat or DEF CON or any other big con, and you'll see Mark or Fyodor or all these names that you've probably never heard of or have never seen, but you use their tools. So, for example, Rainforest Puppy. Rainforest Puppy could walk through the halls of Black Hat and never be noticed. Rainforest Puppy, obviously well known for sequel injection in 97. Fyodor, Gordon, um, who had the most amazing mullet back in the day and liked wearing silver pants. Well, today he's just another bloke at Black Hat. But he wrote Nmap that practically everybody uses. So Chris's talk was really good because he chronicled the start of an industry and not just hacker history, but how hackers actually changed a lot of what we do in the world. And he said basically hackers made security a participatory sport. And what he means by that is when you normally have a job, you come in, you learn your trade, that's it. But with hacking, you are constantly having to relearn stuff. And I've said this to a lot of youngsters who come into the industry, it's one industry where you can't stay still. You know, over 25 years of doing this, I'm constantly learning new stuff. I'm going on my own journey now with hardware exploration and implants and everything else because that's what interests me. In theory, I should have stopped 25 years ago and just said I'm very good at building web applications and leave from there, but I didn't. The other cool thing is you get to learn a lot from your adversary. How many blue teamers here? You have the best job in the world. Blue team is really hard. Pen testing is piss easy, let me tell you. Right, blue teaming, that's a hard job. But the cool thing is, both red team and blue team get to learn from each other. Because you're constantly evolving your tactics. Because attackers are constantly evolving their tactics. So, give you an idea. Um, in the mid-90s, I worked for one of the first dot-coms. Uh, and it was fascinating because that was a really mad time where literally you got away with anything. Um, so, for example, we had pinball machines, we had scale electrics, we had all the other stuff that you would do building web applications. And it was easy back then with security because there was only a couple of hardware, hardware and software vendors. And there was one company called Firewall One, and they charged gazillions for this little box, and it stopped hackers, which was great before the World Wide Web came out because then you had port 80 open and a firewall didn't mean anything. But effectively, it was being sold as, we can do this. And we evolved to test these things, and we wrote tools, and we understood how it was working, and it was very much a give and take type relationship. Then, security tools happened. Now, Alec mentions the rise of some of the first security tools. So, in 1991, uh, another friend of mine, Alec, created what Chris thinks is the first hacking tool, and I'm probably going to believe him, I can't think of another tool before that that was predominantly a hacking tool, security tool, and that was called Crack. Anybody here remember Crack or use Crack? A handful of people. This was the first password brute forcing type tool. And the idea was to take a password file and check to see if people had used weak or insecure passwords. Now, industry, Randall Schwartz used this at Intel when he was there. And he wanted to check to see that the boxes that he was administrating for Intel, the users weren't using weak passwords. They didn't like that, so they fired him, and then he was later charged with a felony for criminal hacking. This was in 1991, right? Then we had Dan Farmer, so Dan and Vietzer. Um, they created a tool that looked for common misconfigurations and vulnerabilities and reported it back in a single type interface, a vulnerability scanner. Um, sadly, Dan got fired from Silicon Graphics for writing this because these tools were really bad, right? They were criminal tools. You don't write tools that allow people to break into stuff because that's bad. Our whole industry is now built around tools that allow you just that. Metasploit. Kali Linux. Kali Linux is an entire, literally, Russian underground of hackers waiting to be used. And it's now acceptable. Then The Hobbit released Netcat in 1996. Now, Netcat has been a phenomenal tool since then. I remember building Vodafone Live in the early 2000s, and you know this was the start of 2G, 3G. It was all very exciting. We had these. Well, we didn't have these. We had big Nokias. Um, and we remember the N900. Um, and we wanted to see if the firewalls were put in properly, so we used to set up a shell on port 53 because DNS wasn't really that good back then, and we'd use Netcat to go all the way through the firewall. 
there was no real good world use for this, because a lot of people thought this was a hacking tool, but this was actually a really, really valuable tool. Now, at the same time, it was very bad to affiliate with hackers. So DEF CON started in late 90s, Black Hat 2000. Going to these conferences, you generally find people that were like us, normal people. All right, the early days of DEF CON, it was very criminal, I won't lie. And um, if you use an ATM in the Alexa Park Springs Hotel, you were probably gonna have your card cloned and everything else. But it was interesting. And around about 2004, we started to see the world's agencies get involved. So it wasn't uncommon to see your Fed or your government agent come into a conference. And it's actually very easy to spot them back then. Chinos, slip-on shoes, tucked in golf shirts, and a nice haircut. Like they generally gave themselves away. And Chris talked about how DEF CON had spot the Fed. And indeed, today, you still have that problem. Um, I used to run SensePost. Um, we've been doing training at Black Hat for a very long time. And the last course we did was called Master Black Ops. And that was effectively teaching people how to be Russian GRU specialists. Um, it was all about infiltration, exfiltration. And I'll never forget, the front row, we had five gentlemen. An Israeli, somebody from Kuwait, somebody from Britain, somebody from Canada, and somebody from the US. They were all working in the federal government. And I'm thinking, this is World War III right there. One guy was a kettle salesman. I mean, you can work better on your cover a little bit. You know, I don't know why kettle salesmen would need to know how to do exfiltration. But effectively, it was that blend of government people, IC people, law enforcement people coming to these hacking conferences to go, we want to learn these skills. At the same time, we also had a lot of problem. If you were a researcher in the early days, you either got arrested or you were threatened with legal action. And a friend of mine, Dragos Roo, who runs the excellent CanSec West, um, did a conference in the EU. And at the time, OSEX was really starting to become really popular. So a lot of us were finding bugs. And I did find a fair number of ODE in OSEX, and we were going to present about it. And Apple got wind of it, and I was threatened with a lawsuit. So we had to pull the talk. This was normal at the time. Because big companies don't like it when you tell people how ugly their child are. And still to this day in 2018, we still have this uneasy tension between the security research community and the product community where they won't accept us trying to help. And I think a key part of it is there's not a malicious action on our side because we use the internet. We use these products. I am an, unfortunately an Apple fanboy. I've been addicted now. I can't get away from it. I couldn't imagine running Linux again, ever. Mostly because I've got two children and a wife. Um, so I can't do that. But our attitude towards security researchers and hackers hasn't changed that much. But what has changed is how these hackers, old school friends of ours, have changed this world. So in the 90s, there was a fair number of hacking collectives, WooWoo, EL8, THC, etc. But WooWoo is probably the ultimate think tank. And what WooWoo has given us is a phenomenally large amount of control on the world that we have today. How many of you here have got WhatsApp on your phone? A fair chunk of people. So on the right is Jan Goom. Jan is one half of WhatsApp, another WooWoo member. Jan recently sold WhatsApp to Facebook for, what, 19 billion? Jan doesn't do security anymore. He's decided to spend time playing with his air-cooled Porsche collection. On the left is Doug Song. Now, Harun talked about him yesterday. Doug is a fabulously intense person. Like, he's really, really intelligent. And he created a company with John called Duo. Duo is a fantastic MFA company. Again, they were just acquired by Cisco for 2.5 billion. He's not the only one. There's plenty in WooWoo who we look at. Uh, another person, Mark Dowd, just sold his company for 50 million in Australia. What we saw from those early days of hacking is that these hackers, and indeed hackers like you, I'm sure, who will go on to it, do have the ability to change a big chunk of how we do this world. So, as I said, one of the cool things about been doing a keynote is I get to look at all the talks. And in that 3.6 million beats, I looked at some of the key talks that were presented at BrewCon and what was going on in our world at the same time. So in 2010, we had our first BrewCon. Now, this was an interesting year because 
It was the year when Google finally admitted the Chinese had touched them in an inappropriate place, um, and that was Operation Aurora. Now, I'm not going to go into deep about Aurora, but effectively it changed a big chunk of how we perceived the concept of the way we build networks. To date, we still build a network like a castle across the road. There's a lovely big perimeter, but inside it's fine. Once you're inside, it's all good. And the Chinese decided, well, we're going to exploit this. We're going to have fun with this. And out of that became the concept of Zero Trust and Beyond Corp. Um, and I'm a big fan of Beyond Corp because I know from an attacker's perspective, it's very, very hard to get into. But also, it could help a lot of companies. Not all, but a lot. At the same time, Joe McRae did a talk about you spent all that money and still got owned. It, the title's still relevant today. Um, if any of you have been to RSA, guaranteed you can find a box that stops everything. It might cost you a couple of million, but it will stop everything. Then, it's, it's very hard to talk about 2010 without Stuxnet. Now, I think every generation will have its own version of Stuxnet. For those who are operating at the time, that was our digital Hiroshima. Um, this lot have WannaCry, not Petya. Petya, sometimes Petya. Could be Petya, maybe not Petya. Um, and it was all about the start of, could we take malware and do something really nasty with it? And weirdly enough, Paul Asadorian did a talk about my plot to take over the world. Starting to see like Brucon has got a very good finger in the pulse. Then in 2010, there was the first Malcon. Now this is important because this was the first malware only conference in India sponsored by a government. Call me paranoid. It was the start of where malware could be seen as a tool to gain access to people and data. Um, at the same time, at Brucon, Tyler Shields at Vericode did an amazing talk about the monkey steals the berries. Now, this was fascinating because he finally did research into the state of commercial mobile spyware. So a couple of years ago, uh, a colleague of mine, Vlad and I, did a talk at um, a Paranoia Conference in Norway, and it was all about us doing six months research into the global ugly world of surveillance where it's no longer the realm of governments, but anybody can buy surveillance-grade software, such as Hacking Team or NSO Group. Well, Tyler was doing this in 2010, so eight years ago. Then, 2011, the internet mosquitoes known as LulzSec um, came about. And it was interesting for them because, you know, the script kitty has always been with us. It's just back in my day, the script kitty never had Twitter. So LulzSec was effectively doing something that had been done for a very long time. It's just they were really effective because they had lots of followers. But they also gave rise to the fact that the anonymous, we are anonymous crap, saying we can actually rally a whole group of people and do a lot of damage. Um, at the same time, Nikki, Nikki Forakis came with a talk about abusing locality and shared web browsing, which was a big chunk of how LulzSec did what they did, besides learning how to use SQL map. Um, then the PlayStation Network got pwned. I'm not a gamer. Um, it's one thing I'm really bad at. But I was told this was really bad to a lot of 14-year-olds because they couldn't do stuff on the internet. Little did we know that this was the start of things to come. Um, Andrei Belenko also did a phenomenal talk on iOS forensics. And I think for me, 2011 was the time when Apple started to shift away from being the kicking boy of all things bad to being a very, very good security company like we see today. Um, then Slink. It, it's really hard to not talk about 2011 and not talk about Slink. Because Slink decided he was going to own every single damn thing on the internet. Uh, and he pretty much did. Um, some of his targets were there were DOD, Pentagon, NASA, US military, Navy, Space and Naval Warfare System Command, UK government, US government. I mean, <coughs> balls on that kid were phenomenal. Um, we're going to own everything that we did back in the 90s. We just didn't tell the world about it. Um, and then Iftak Ian Almet talked about data, data exfiltration. Now, prior to that, when you popped a network, you generally popped a network and you thought, right, that's, I'm done, I've got a shell. But there was a significant shift with attackers and criminals at the time where they thought, popping a network is only really the first stage. We can actually steal stuff. We actually have data now we can do stuff with. So 
Amit's talk about exfiltrating that data out was actually really fascinating because of the insight of, I need to get large amounts of data out without anybody knowing. And as we know, we completely fixed that problem in the internet today. 2012. Um, how many of you break passwords here? You probably have a copy of the LinkedIn database because it's the gift that keeps on giving. And let's be honest, most people have never changed their passwords since. Um, and then a highly, highly brilliant talk I recommend you watch by Josh and Jericho on cyber warfare, not what we were expecting. And this talk delved about how up to that day we've been very cautious and careless at the same time in using the term cyber warfare and way too many Sun Tzu quotes. Then we started to see the ugliness. So the Saudi Aramco oil company was hit by an ugly piece of malware called Shamoon. Very similar to Stuxnet, it's a nasty piece of malware, it didn't just do good things, it did a lot of ugly things. I'll read it if you can. Um, and then Matty van Hoof. Ma is Matty here? This man has made wireless annoying and amazing at the same time because he constantly every year comes up with stuff when you think, damn Matty, like, what do you do at home? How are you breaking this stuff? This is where we got introduced to the genius that is Matty, and he found new flaws in WPA TKIP. And then finally Slink, you know, he wasn't finished, he'd owned most of the government organizations, he thought, you know what, I'm gonna go after industrial control systems. Because hackers in a power grid, like what's the worst that could happen? At the same time, Ed Skudas did a great talk on unleashing the dogs of cyber war. So we're now starting to get an idea of like where was the research world going? What were we starting to expect from a warfare perspective? 2013, and you know, after exfiltrating and learning how to exfiltrate, attackers decided we can make some cash out of this, and Target was pwned. Uh, massive credit card breach, lots of people losing a lot of money, um, and Didier, who is an absolute legend in my mind came up with a workshop on advanced Excel hacking. Now, if anybody of you, how many of you have been on Didier's workshops? <laughs> like, he is phenomenal. I will attend one of his workshops one day. What Didier has done to make the world realize that office documents are utterly crap, are anything but writing love letters, has been well regarded. So thank you, Didier, for that. It's huge. <laughs> Then things got a bit weird. Uh, the New York Times was pwned. Now, that's not unusual. I mean, newspapers get pwned a lot, right? Well, not in this case. New York Times wrote an article that fingered China and said, well, China weren't being very good, and there was a lot of questionable trades and stuff happening out of China. Chinese government turned around and said, well, that's groundless, you know, that's a load of rubbish. And then a week later, New York Times was opponed. Um, nothing new there, we're not saying that the Chinese did it. But interestingly, New York Times got really angry and pointed the blame at an antivirus vendor called Symantec because Symantec didn't pre protect them enough. I mean, shock, horror, an antivirus agent was easily bypassed. I mean, is there nothing sacred on the internet anymore? At the same time, Rob Graham, who errata Rob, and if you don't follow him on Twitter, he is phenomenal at ranting, but also great insight as to what's happening in the world. He did a great talk on data plane network. And for me, this is probably one of my standout talks of all times at Brucon, because he talks about the lessons that other industries have had when it comes to learning their mistakes. So for example, with 9-11 and the building falling down, Engineers realize what should be rectified afterwards. And as a relatively young industry, we still haven't learned that mistake or learned that lesson. Then 2014, now this is where it really starts to get interesting because um, Sony got pwned. Um, and, and we now know why Sony got pwned because the indictments were a week and a half ago. Seems that jolly fat fellow in North Korea is very good at building a hacking team. Um, and you know, Joe Grand also did an amazing talk about using superpowers for hardware reversing. 2014 for me was the year of the hardware attacks at Brucon. Mt. Gox became bankrupt. How many of you are crypto billionaires? Well, were crypto billionaires. Sorry, tough, sore subject, I know. Um, it was an absolute shock to me that these crypto exchanges were broken into 
and people stole funds. Um, and I did a keynote this year um, in Dubai, and I got one figure where so far, since the crypto exchanges have come to life, $15 billion has been stolen from them because there was no regulation or compliance. And I never thought in 2018 I would be calling for regulation and compliance. So obviously something has happened. At the same time, Snare did a phenomenal talk. And I think it's probably one of the last talks I can think of where we see Snare talking about hardware stuff. I urge you, go and watch the talk. He's colorful, there's great language, like he's just brilliant. And he talked about thunderbolts and lightning and how you could create covert channels in everyday pieces of hardware. Have you heard that story before? Then 2015, and OPM got pwned. Um, OPM is the Office of Personal Management. Basically, if you're in the US and you want to do your clearance, at some point, your world is going to go through them. Now, my personal OPM story was I was on a military base in West Virginia when that happened with a large group of special forces and other people, and I saw the absolute fear going to the minds and eyes of people who will kill you with a spoon because they thought, shit, there is a lot of stuff I put on that file, and the Chinese now have it. Um, and then another one, Mark Hillick's amazing leveling up security. Like, it is literally one of those talks I urge you to watch because it gives an insight as to other things you should be doing when it comes to security. Something I wish OPM had learned about. At the same time, Ashley Madison was popped. Now, I'm going to be honest here, I had no idea what Ashley Madison was. Mostly because I didn't need to go to a website to have an affair. I've got a lovely wife at home. But it turns out, two and a half thousand people did. Obviously, we got hold of the database whilst we are in this military base, and we thought, let's look to see if anybody's using their classified email addresses. DOD.gov, DOD.mil, FBI.x. Works out that quite a few agents and military personnel use their personal email addresses for this site. Now, you're probably thinking that's absolutely stupid, but from an OPSEC perspective, it's actually genius. Because this is a website that allows you to have an extramarital affair. So therefore, you're not going to be using your Gmail because your wife won't be allowed to check your government-issued email address. At least they thought until it was breached. Then things got very weird. Unit 8200, which is the Israeli you know, version of NSA, decided to attack Russia. Well, actually, Kaspersky, which is sort of Russia, but not really Russia. And they did so because Kaspersky were quite annoying in reporting about a lot of campaigns that the Israelis were doing. And Kaspersky was attacked by a variant of Duku. So they joined the dots together. And it was very much icy handbags at dawn, but it was good for us bystanders to watch, you know, mummy and daddy fighting about stuff that we didn't really have an idea. Um, at the same time, William and Jonathan talked about the real Shim Shady. Shim Shady, yeah, sorry. Um, and that was fascinating because it was all about how the DIN attack did a DOS against Ecuador because Ecuador dared to take away Julian Assange's internet, which in all fairness was probably a great thing and half the internet thanks you very much for doing so. But it was about how crowd-sourced hacking has become quite a big thing. Then, the year that changed everything for me, the Bangladeshi bank got pwned. And if the printer hadn't run out of my, uh, print paper, and they'd actually use a proper spelling check person, they would have got away with $951 million. Like the biggest bank heist in history. Since then, we've learned a lot about Unit 121, or General Reconnaissance Bureau, North Korea's hacking army. I've spent the last four years looking into Kim and what he can do. And for me, it was fascinating as to how you create an amazing cyber warfare capability that is North Korea. So for example, how do you deal with North Korea when they hack you? Normally, if an attacker tries to get after you, you go to the police. You hope that they're in your jurisdiction, then the police can act. But how do you deal with a North Korean threat? Because the police aren't interested. So you then go up to the government level. Government's not going to do much. What can they do? And Kim managed to exploit this to such a degree where there's been lots of articles written about what they do, their tactics, the malware that they use. But the point is, they're still stealing money. They're still very effective at it. And part of me wants to give a little bit of credit going, you've done what a lot of Western intelligence agencies have wanted to do forever. 
but are shackled by laws and morality. At the same time, John Strand did a great talk on active defense. How do you start moving away from being easily pwnable? Then we had the DNC email leak. These Russians and North Koreans are actually quite annoying. Um, and Stefan did a great talk on scraping leaky browsers. So we started to see how researchers are now moving away from just the OS to look at the tools we're using on a daily basis. And indeed, browsers are quite insecure. Then we had the DIN cyber attack, which was interesting. And Deviant Olam did a perfect doors and locks talk. How do you break into physical things? Again, that physical element is still coming back into what we're doing. 2017, um, WannaCry Petcher. To be fair, I'm really bored of WannaCry Petcher. I'm sure many of you are. I'm not going to talk about it a lot. It was great. It's been overanalyzed. It was a bad thing. Don't lose your tool sets. OPSEC's really hard. Hard in your shit, NSA. Um, leaving at that. But John and Josh did a talk um, called Meet. Now, I go back to the story where researchers are penalized, and they were going to do this at a certain conference, and they worked for a certain payment something, and they were fired. Um, because it was like the name, hindsight, they could have chosen a better name. But their employer at the time didn't like the fact that this talk, which was on a modern way of malware C2 control frameworks, could look upon them. So they were fired. Um, so I urge you to go look at the talk, because it's an interesting idea, and it did lose, you know, cost them their job. And then finally, Equifax. Um, like, there's a lot to be said about patching, and as Equifax showed us, like, it's still really hard. And then finally, Slamo Majasek talked about hacking Bluetooth smart locks. And with what we saw yesterday with the ruin of the BitFi, people are still looking at everyday security and pony it. So I think there's one thing that came out of watching all of those is I have to give a massive round of applause to the review board for what they did. So respect. I can honestly say being on a review board, it is very, very hard to look at submissions. It takes a lot of time. You do a lot of research. And you want to make sure that the best person comes through. So massive job. But I think there's something we can come into here. We truly do live in fascinating times. And yesterday, what happened made me rewrite a big chunk of my slides. First up, we had the NCSC, which is the cute, cuddly arm of GCHQ, send out a tweet saying, we have identified that a number of cyber actors widely known to have been conducting attacks around the world are, in fact, the Russian GRU. Cue absolute paranoia and shock. Vladimir Putin has been really bad. Um, but this was quite a fascinating story because it's the first time ever Western intelligence agencies are now coming up and saying Russia's been really bad. And I ironic because GCHQ aren't really that nice. I mean, I'm in a country where they took control of a certain mobile phone operator to do nasty covert stuff. But it turns out these Russian spies from Unit 26165 drove around Europe taking selfies. Um, and they used really elite hacking tools, as the Dutch found out. Um, this was found on them. Um, the amazing thing here is we often think that spies have got access to amazing kits. No, 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 no. That's, that's a Wi-Fi pineapple up there. Now, I guess if I go into the mind of a spy, what they did was, OK, guys, we're going to go and uh, hack some stuff in Switzerland. Uh, we need to learn how to hack. Vladislav, go and have a look at the page. So they went to Darren's page, and they thought, I need to learn how to do hacking on Wi-Fi Pineapple. Darren and Shannon effectively were drafted into the Russian intelligence agency to teach them how to hack. Because, I mean, why else would you use a Wi-Fi? But at the same time, you almost think, like, they messed up because they had taxi receipts from the GRU to Moscow airport. They were doing selfies at the Olympic Village. They were doing really bad stuff. I mean, if only it were there was a guy out there who could teach them how to do OPSEC, and the Grok is going to kill me for this, for using that picture. Um, he's tried to get it removed from the internet, but lots of love, Grok. But it's like, we put a lot of the spies and that capability on these massive pedestals. When in reality, like, they're just like all of us. They're using the tools that we build. They're using the frameworks. They're using YouTube. A lot of people are doing this stuff. It, we remove away from the fact they're not superhuman beings. Please don't tweet that picture to Grok. Thanks very much. 
Thanks. Um, and then yesterday, a story that just blew up was Bloomberg. Has anybody read the story, seen about the story? Turns out that the pesky Chinese um, have been putting really small 8-pin soics, micro soics, into servers and doing traditional hardware implants. Now, for those who've been involved in that world for a long time, it's not necessarily a new thing, and indeed supply chain attacks are relatively old. But effectively, it turns out the story goes, and I'll let you read it, Amazon were doing a review of a com company called Elemental. Um, Elemental did amazing software that did video compression. It sounds like a story from Silicon Valley, if anybody watches that. Um, and Elemental used a super micro baseboard for that, which cost $100,000. They looked at the uh, motherboard, and they saw this weird little grain light chip um, on the, next to the baseband that they didn't really know what was there. Q massive panic. Um, turns out that Supermicro supply servers all over the world, DOD, CIA, drone operations, Navy warships, Apple, etc. Um, this is probably going to run for a while. But it just goes to show what amazing times we're in when Bloomberg is reporting on covert implants into devices as a mega story. And it's really interesting because we don't know if it's right or wrong. I mean, I can guarantee now that there's a lot of hardware geeks like me that are going to be trawling a big chunk of Alibaba and AliExpress looking for these chips. And we're all going to be talking about how you can exfiltrate her and how this might affect the bootloader and so on. There's going to be lots of experts on TV. We just don't know. Of course, Apple and Amazon have said straight up, it's not us. But what was fascinating was a lot of people are kind of shocked still that supply chain attacks are a thing, when in reality they've been happening for a very, very long time. Because if you want to gain access to stuff, you do it right at the start. So this leads me to a thing where I think it's no longer an IT issue. You know, In the past, if there was a security vulnerability, let IT fix it. The business doesn't have to worry about it. So I thought, well, we're actually quite bad at fixing stuff. Let's see if I can get some stats of how bad. And thankfully, Trustwave supplied the report that did this. Now, it's really hard to look at metrics prior to 2008, mostly because the logging and telemetry wasn't really there. The tools weren't that very good, and we weren't very good at sharing how bad we were. But as we can see there, like, you know, if we look at vulnerability disclosures per year, the highs have had moderate pickup, but it's the medium level ones that have gone through mad. Now, that could be one of two things, right? The first is, if we look at the internet users worldwide, well, it's, it's grown massively. More and more people are using the net. And if we look at the world population, that kind of tallies up with people using the internet. Um, there are some people born today who've never not known the internet. Um, funnily enough, last night I was watching a music video on YouTube, like you do while you're doing slides, and it was from 1994, 94, 92, and it was a concert, and there wasn't a single smartphone in the audience. What an amazing time. Now, if you look at concerts, everybody's watching the concert through their phone, which is quite weird. So if we look at compromised demographics, um, things, they're getting better-ish. What the report said was, in North America in 2016, like, you know, 50% of companies had been popped of some sort. It's gone down to 43. Latin America has done a lot better. Europe in the Middle East has actually gone up. That's because Europe in the Middle East has grown, so I kind of understand there. And Asia Pacific, well, that shot up again. Asia Pacific's generally behind three, four years behind the rest of the world when it comes to security, so I understand that. But then they dove into, like, we hear about these stories about what is the data. Remember I talked about the fact that we can now exfiltrate data out. So here we look at a healthcare record, and this is US-centric, I'm sorry. So for basic personal information, you're looking at three cents a record. Credit record, 31, Social Security, 53, it's boring. Um, banking record, $4, okay, that could be interesting, I can do a lot of fraud with that. Finally, payment card details, $5.40, $5 but for healthcare, 250 bucks. How many of you got an Apple Watch? You are worth a fortune. Your data is worth a lot of money to some people. Um, but here's the sad thing, is that in 2016, it took 65 days for somebody to notice that they were popped. 2017, that's risen to 83 days. Intrusion detection, 2016, 49 days. 2017, 26, we're getting better. 
seeing when somebody's in the network. Still 20 to 76 days is a lot. And the fact is, attackers often have access to compromised environments for months, and in some cases, years. And that's an alarming statement to make, because it shouldn't be days, it shouldn't be months, it should be hours. So generally, when we were breaking into stuff, we needed stuff to do really quickly. But nowadays, you can literally go on holiday and your shell's still there three weeks later. And the normal thing, systems that use default credentials, so administrative access, with the second highest share. So we're in a phase now where more vulnerabilities means greater potential for exploitation. And that's no shock. And it's my opinion, here's where the, the wavy keynote stuff is, we're kind of moving into a responsibility era. So in 2007, due to circumstances of being chased by law enforcement, I decided to take a break and move to Thailand and went back to photography. And I went into conflict photography because there's nothing better than sneaking into Burma to take pictures of illegal logging with a KNLA trying to get you than, you know, get your mind off InfoSec. And at the same time, I lived with a lot of friends in Bangkok who were conflict photographers in conflict regions around the world. And we're talking Iraq, Syria, Afghan. And I used to hear their stories and their stories of how IEDs were really causing an issue. And there was a, a great um, article by Rick Atkinson, Washington Post in 2007, entitled Left of Boom. And what the Left of Boom did, it talked about how the US military spent billions combating the threat of the IED. Because the IED was the great leveler. You had the massive force of the US military going through with four and a half, five million dollar people carriers. And you had a very simple device, it's always a Nokia. You know, even in an IED, you can't blow a Nokia up. It was a very simple device that cost a couple of dollars to make that used to wipe out a big chunk of personnel. And indeed, Throughout the war in Afghan and Iraq and um, Syria, 60% uh, of all American fatalities were caused by the IED, more than 3,500 in total. So effectively, here we have a $50 device that can disable a million dollar armored vehicle. And this was all about the story about what America did, right? And as such, they created the joint IED defeat organization called GEDO, and the idea behind this was lots of people talking about how do we fix this, right? How do we stop these pesky IEDs from hurting us? And it was interesting. Basically, what they tried to do was they're never going to eliminate the IED. And there's a lot of similarities here with hacking and security. We're never going to eliminate the attacker. But what they did was try and make it as expensive as possible for those laying the IED so they were less laid. And at the same time, they got better with improved detection, disablement, and protection against the bombs. And for me, that's always stuck. Listening to the stories that these reporters had was, we're still in our left of boom phase. Because we still think that spending billions on boxes that protect people from O'Day are going to fix stuff, when in reality. And it's coming up with a lot of people as well. So Alex Stamos tweeted a while back, as we are entering an unprecedented era of anti-tech sentiment, it's going to be important for the civil liberties and privacy access communities to guard against being played by those who want more government speech, control, and data access. We're the gatekeepers of a lot of systems. We need to start making sure they're a lot more secure. To give you an idea, in June 7th, 2013, Ed told us about the NSA PRISMS collection. And the 0.001% of the world thought, this is wrong, this is really bad, they shouldn't be doing this. There was lots of uproar, lots of hand wringing. Not much happened. Last year, Dylan Curran on Twitter said, want to freak yourself out? I'm going to show you how much of your information the likes of Facebook and Google store without you realizing it. We're not learning our lessons. We're not worried about the intelligence agents anymore. We're worried about the likes of Google and Facebook collecting vast amounts of data. So I guess we're coming into a back to the basics part. Right? We need to literally reboot. And last year at Black at Asia, Halvar Flake did a phenomenal talk, and I really urge you to go and watch this. Halvar doesn't need any introduction. Uh, he's probably one of the most smartest people in the world. But he talked about how we failed to build a dependable, defendable internet. And one of the things he talked about, and it's quite apt with yesterday's announcement, is the ability to have a global distributed ledger of known good firmware for hardware. So we could tell if firmware or hardware has been tampered with. But he also talked about 
some of the problems that CISOs have today. So for example, CISO in a company goes in and says, right, we're going to create the company a amazing security posture. This is what we do. So he sits with her or his team and says, right, what do we need to make sure the organization is secure? And they come together with these security crimes. Then that goes through to the enterprise, and the enterprise goes through to vendors and says, hey, software vendors, we need this, this, and this. The reality is that doesn't really happen. What you do have is a group of people who go to RSA, who get bamboozled by vendors who promise the world, who install really expensive stuff into a network, and you're still left with the same problem we've got before. Halvar also then talks about the fact that we, as a market, don't have much choice in what's out there. So for example, if you wanted to buy an Intel chip that doesn't have the management console on, does anybody try to do that? No. Intel tells you that is what you're selling. Hard disk manufacturers, there's three in the world. We're kind of at the wits of what the hardware and the software world tells us we can buy. And Halvar's main argument is we need to rethink that. We need to club together and say, hey, actually, Intel, we don't want your back door in our chips. Fix it, otherwise we're not going to buy any more chips. But we don't. It's a really great talk, and it starts touching upon ideas that I think a lot of us could learn from. But then he also does amazing talks on Twitter, and if you don't follow him, recommend him. He says, people speak about the security poverty line, but the harsh truth is that there's an engineering poverty line in tech, and many large, world-famous companies fall below it. Good security is, not, is normally a result of healthy IT, engineering culture, and competence. The reality, most organizations struggle to keep their stuff running or inventory and read. As we've seen in the last two, three years, people are getting attacked because they've forgotten they've got stuff on the internet. That's basic IT 101. It doesn't matter we've got a million euro box that protects us from O'Day if we completely forgot about the struts vulnerability, the prime faces vulnerability that's out there on the internet. And that goes back to basic engineering. Now, my old man is an engineer. Um, he builds all refineries and diamond plants. He's that typical annoying old school engineer, especially if you're trying to grow up and you call yourself a computer engineer and he laughs at you. He said, the problem is, you guys don't build stuff well. Um, and he gave me the analogy of a lift, and it stuck with me ever since. So a lift, I only had managed to find figures for the US, apologies. There's 18 billion passenger trips in the US in lifts. There's 27 deaths. Okay, so that's 0.015%. So the lifts are pretty safe, right? And he said, well, the re is, because if you look at lift design, right, the first is people get together and decide we're going to build a box that carries people upstairs, right, so they don't have to walk on stairs. Great. So we need to do that, and we're going to write down the specifications. It's got to be strong, made of steel from this company. It's going to have to use this type of cable. It's going to have this, you know, software mechanisms in, and it's going to cost this much. So people get together, they do the funding, and then they build it. And it gets built to standards. The cable has to be tested to not stretch. The cable's got to be tested when there's more people than allowed in the lift, because who reads signs? Like maximum 12 people, 17 people get in. It's also got to be proven, right? So they go and they test it at laboratories. Then it gets shipped worldwide. The difference is, if that doesn't happen, lots of people get crushed and become really small as they plummet 17 floors to the floor and scream a lot. The same can't be said for software security, because we like slinging code like mad, and what is fine is ship. What's the worst that could happen? Well, we're now seeing what the worst can happen, because we're now seeing governments and intelligence communities abuse these things that we've introduced because we don't pay much attention to what we're shipping. And we've kind of lost our way. And I think that's quite sad for somebody who's been using this internet for 25 plus years, is that we've got to the point now where we either continue and let people abuse what we create, or we take a stand. And one of the key things is um, a guy called Gene Kim, and he's written a great book called The Phoenix Project. Um, and if you're involved in the whole shifting left thing, he says, information security is always flashing their badges at people and making urgent demands, regardless of the consequences to the rest of the organization, which is why we don't invite them to many meetings. And that's actually quite harsh, because throughout my career, security has always been seen as the weird ones, the ones who constantly say no. And one of the things that we're trying to change is actually say yes more. Because for me, a good security engineer looks at a problem and goes, I like that new feature. I'm going to try and make it more secure for you, rather than just saying no. 
And we also live in an amazing period where there's lots and lots of information out there. So 2003, we formed OWASP. Um, I wrote the first web app testing book, and now I'm responsible for the application security verification standard. And the idea is we want to kind of make applications a lot more secure. So Andrew, Jim, and I are looking at version 4. And we put a call out saying, listen, like one of the things that we think is a little bit bad at the moment is the architecture section. Like it's not been updated since 2009. The ASVS is used all over the world. Dutch tax office uses it, HMRC uses it, hospitals use it. So we're really, really proud of what we've done, but we know we can do better. And one of the things that came up on Twitter the other day was, we need to start referencing other groups work out there, which is something we don't do very well in security. So for example, the IEEE have got principles in secure design, and we definitely need to incorporate that. And I guess for me, that's kind of my final thought. Security needs to be more of an enabler. And there's a lot of new faces in the industry here at the moment. There's a lot of old faces in the industry. But effectively, it's now up to us to try and use what we learn at Brucon, use what we learn on a daily basis, to try and not allow mediocrity come into stuff that millions of people use. Because as we've seen, if the Chinese can put small eight-pin soiks into a hardware box and cause Bloomberg to go absolutely ape, we've got the ability to stop people from doing that. So thank you very much.